Uh, thank you, Diggs fam. I know they're kind of serving all around. Um, but man, what a gift and what just a beautiful picture of love. Um, well, gosh, friends, welcome. Welcome to Restoration Church. Um, I'm Katie. I am one of the lead pastors here, and I'm so glad that you are here joining us. I'm so glad that you who are watching online, that you're joining us as well. Um, and I'm just really, really glad to be here today. Um, Today's the second Sunday of Advent, you know, as Kurt shared, and the theme for this week, if you haven't already figured it out, um, is love. And I don't know about you, but this time of year is uh, very emotion-full for me. Um, I've, like, already cried three times since the gathering started, so... You know, if that's you too, we're in good company. We're going to make it through, guys. Um, but even though I, I kind of know that about myself over the years, I kind of know what to expect. I kind of know that the, the preparing our hearts, that all that what this season encompasses, I, I know what that work does in me year after year. Um, it also seems like just you know, all the traditions and the nostalgia, all of the beauty um, and all of what is lovely this time of year. Um, it seems like all of that just kind of kicks my emotional world like into hyperdrive. Um, there's so much that is, you know, all of these amazing, beautiful things that just take our breath away. Um, but if we're honest, you know, the flip side of that same coin is that there's also so much that can make us feel stressed or sad or anxious or, or even angry this time of year. Um, and so if you can relate to any of that, um, then I'm really glad you're here because Advent is simply an invitation, you know, as Lisa said in that video, that, that everything belongs. Advent is this, this beautiful time for us to just create space in the midst of our fast-paced lives, uh, to simply reflect, to reorient our lives, to, to reorient our worship around Jesus. Um, and that is something that, you know, not just at Christmas time is important to do, but that is something that, you know, all year long we have that same invitation. But, you know, as Kurt shared with that, uh, that glorious Advent devotional, you know, I hope you've been following along with that. Um, if you haven't picked one up, again, we would highly encourage you to do that. Um, but today, as we kind of enter into day eight of Advent, uh, I, I love that we simply can just pick up wherever you're at um, and, and really journey together. That this is something, you know, the reason why we light the candle and read these passages and, and share stories of what God has done over this last year is because God has truly given us this community, this space where we go out through all the week. Uh, throughout the week, we're all in our separate world, in our workplace, at home, in our neighborhoods, uh, in our classrooms, and then we come together for special moments like this to mark what it is that God is doing and what it is that unites all of us around this name of Jesus. And so in case you weren't here last week as we kind of kicked off this idea, um, Kurt shared with us this image, and this image shows... Um, kind of hard to read, but you kind of see on the outer circle, it's all the months of the year, and then the inner circle kind of marks Advent and Christmas, um, and all of the seasons, you know, it goes through Lent and Easter and Pentecost and ordinary time, and all of what um, is called the, the church calendar, which basically just means Christians for centuries have organized um, around the rhythm, the calendar, and the seasons of the year, uh, organize them around the life of Christ. Um, it's a way of life where we can simply live into the scriptural themes, um, align our hearts with what Jesus experienced throughout his life. Um, and so Advent is actually the very beginning of the church calendar or the liturgical year. Um, and because it's the time that we orient ourselves around the beginning or we're awaiting the beginning of the life of Christ, we're posturing ourselves in waiting for Jesus to arrive, for his earthly life to begin. Um, it's a way that now, you know, as we look at that wall and say empowering all people to love and follow Jesus, um, it's a way that now in 2022, uh, we can simply live out that mission um, of loving and following Jesus. And so it's kind of amazing, you know, when I think of that, um, even just hearing Luis read uh, from the passage from Isaiah, reading that in Spanish, hearing it in English, um, I don't know what that did. That was one of the three times I cried, by the way. Um, 
But it's amazing to me uh, to think about the fact that Christians all over the world who speak all different languages, who represent all different denominations, uh, come together around these same themes, around these same passages, year after year after year. And just like what the Angelus family just read, um, we also see in these passages um, that just like in the prophet Isaiah, whose words were you know, recorded about 700 years before Jesus was even born, we see this profound amount of waiting, right? 700 years is a long time. I mean, I had a doctor appointment like this week and, you know, I got a test and it's like a minor test results that I'm waiting and it's like, it's going to take three weeks. I'm like, three weeks, that's forever, right? But imagine 700 years of waiting, of waiting for this long awaited prophet, for this King of Kings, for this Messiah, God with us, Emmanuel. His Arrival was foretold and long awaited for generations and generations and generations, right? And I'm sure that you maybe noticed the intensity, you know, as Luis and Carla and Elisa and Esteban were reading those words, maybe you noticed the intensity, this going back and forth between kings about putting God to the test. You're like, whoa, what's happening? Stuff's hitting the fan over here, right? They're asking for a sign and everyone's patience is being tried. I mean, imagine what that must have been like for these people as they're waiting. I mean, it sounds a little bit like 2022, but that's besides the point. Right, God's people, the truth is, God's people had gotten so far off track. They have wandered. They had uh, made a mess of their lives. They were lost in need of a savior, right? So that intensity was actually a fitting thing. They had gotten so far off track, and right at that moment was time for God to come in his rescuing power to reset and to reconcile all of what had gotten lost in this world, right? And we read those words about Jesus. I mean, it talks about, you know, curds and honey, and and that was basically like ancient Jewish uh, baby food, right? So that's what it's referring to. It's saying that um, Jesus would be so right in a cesspool of wrong, that this toddler Jesus, right, this baby Jesus would be eating his baby food, kind of giving everyone else the what's up, the what for, saying this is right, this is wrong, that even at a young age, Jesus, his heart, who he was, was bent towards justice, was bent towards rightness, that he would set right in this world all of what had gone wrong. Right? And now, it's easy to hear a passage like that and kind of be like, whoa, I thought this message was about love. Uh, I'm feeling a little, like, heavy, right? Uh, Geez, God, what's with all the wrath and judgment? Where's the grace? Where's the love? Where's all the warm feelings that make me feel all Christmassy inside? I mean, maybe it's just me asking that. Um, But, I mean, the fact that God's divinity came to earth, I mean, let's just kind of, like, put our minds there for a minute. The fact that that all of God's divinity came to earth wrapped up in Jesus' humanity as an infant. I mean, friends, for real, that's, that's beyond words. That is, that is glorious. That is the definition of the word glorious. But it's also gritty. It's also raw and real, right? It's so raw and it's so real that it split time into before and after, History from that moment Jesus entered the world was never the same. There was a before Jesus, there was an after Jesus. And so, I'm wondering, right, for God to make such a bold move of epic proportions, there must have been an equally epic why. For him to go to such drastic measures, to come in saving power for all of us, What was his why? Why would God do that? What was going on in his heart? I mean, for Jesus to leave all power, to leave all privilege, to leave the right hand of the Father, to leave his throne in heaven, he felt he left all of that glory so that he could come bring just a fraction of that glory here to earth. That all was lost, all was broken without him, and his deep Love for you, his deep love for me, his deep love for the world was his why. That was the reason. And it still is. And wait, because it gets even better, 
right? It gets even better. This love of God, this incredible love that God has for you and for me is actually a gift. It's free for the taking. There's no earning. There's no proving, right? We don't have to measure up to God's standard. It's free for all of us. We don't have to achieve our way to God's love, right? Even though there are moments in life where we might feel unwanted, where we might feel unnoticed, we may even feel like we don't love ourselves. Even in those moments, Jesus says, I'd do anything for you. I'd spare no expense. Even when we do the things that God hates, Jesus still comes. He enters into the mess so that he can free us. Why? It's because he loves us. And here's what I want us to make sure that as we kind of step into the story, and and we're going to get into God's word here in just a minute, um, but here's what I don't want us to miss because it's really easy to kind of maybe misunderstand this. God's love is free. It's a gift. It's free for the taking. God's love is free, but it isn't cheap. God's love is free, but it costs God a lot. His love is free, but it isn't cheap. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life, right? If you grew up in church, if you've gone to a football game, right, you've seen John 3.16 held up at the end zone on a poster board. And if you're like me, right, maybe it can seem cliche or it can seem cheap because it's just there, right? But today, we want to be sure that we don't mistake cheap when it comes to God's love. Today, we're going to look at the story of the single human who poured out perhaps the most love, sacrificed the most, uh, and perhaps experienced the the deepest joy and intimacy with Jesus uh, throughout his life on earth. Uh, We're going to look at the life of Mary. We're going to look at her words. Uh, Jesus' mom, um, she's poured out some pretty stunning uh, words, and we're going to get an incredible picture of the love and the heroic trust in God's goodness through the life of Mary. And so um, we're going to be reading today from Luke uh, chapter 1, um, which you can turn to in one of these blue Bibles, um, if you have one either under your seat or in the pocket in front of you. Um, you can find it on page uh, 614. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 1 verse 42, but as you flip there, um, it's important to us uh, that you have a Bible that you can read, that you can understand. Um, So if you don't have one, or if yours um, is too hard to understand, or has these and thous and and crazy things that we don't actually talk like that, um, this Bible in your hands is now yours, uh, because we truly believe that God's word uh, reveals his heart. And when we experience God's heart, it changes our life. So congratulations, Um, you now own a Bible. Um, If you're here, take that home. Our team loves uh, replenishing them and and putting them in the seats. Gives us deep joy. Um, So just to set up a little bit more context as we, um, before we we jump in, uh, as Kurt mentioned last week, you know, we talked about how um, there's one page in between the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, who was a prophet, and before there's one page in between when it starts Matthew, the first page of, of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. That page in the middle represents 400 years of silence, where all this prophetic activity, God was speaking through people, God was preparing the way um, the people kind of needed to hear, they needed their hearts to be a little bit primed for what was coming next. Um, Um, And then God kind of ghosted for 400 years, not a word. Um, And then, all of a sudden, we see an angel appears to Mary, informing her that she was to give birth to the Savior of the world, to set in motion a series of events um, that would fulfill those very same prophecies that were told um, some six, seven, five hundred years prior. Uh, But prior to Mary's miraculous pregnancy, believe it or not, there is actually another miraculous pregnancy. Those of you who've read the story, uh, maybe you are familiar with that. There's another uh, pregnancy that took place with Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, um, who had long-awaited 
desired, deeply prayed for, waited, waited, waited for a child her whole life alongside her husband, Zechariah, who was a priest. Then finally, in their old age, right, they are past, past the age where uh, that normally happens, um, we have another biological impossibility uh, that became suddenly possible because of God. God saw it fit and suitable um, to bring another baby boy who would grow up to be John the Baptist. Um, And John the Baptist, his calling was to prepare the way for Jesus, to prime the hearts of the people to one day receive the message that Jesus would bring. So uh, that's where we're picking up from in Luke uh, 1, verse 42. Uh, We're going to read about this incredible moment when Mary, the mother of Jesus, so she was pregnant with Jesus, and Elizabeth is pregnant with John. This moment where they reunite where they're both carrying these miracle babes in their bellies, uh, processing all of the glory that they're experiencing in their new daily reality. And so uh, join with me as we read together, starting in verse 42. It says, Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Imagine that, that through the spiritual connection, that even these babies were aware of that God was doing something incredible. It goes on to say, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And then this is Mary's response. All right, after Elizabeth just proclaims this love and adoration and this awe of what God had done in this moment, here's what Mary says as Mary responds. She says, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. Right? And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. You know, at this point, Mary had kind of gotten over the initial shock of the angel coming and telling her she's, she's had some time to realize, okay, God, this is happening, whether I'm here for it or not, so let's be on board, right? And we see this beautiful love pouring out of Mary, that she is in awe, probably a little bit shaken in her boots, but also in awe of what God is doing. It goes on, verse 49, to say, for the mighty one is holy, And he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. And he has scattered the proud and haughty ones. And he had brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has exalted the humble. He had filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He helped his servant Israel, and he remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. See, I love that as Mary is exclaiming these incredible words as she's pouring out this prophecy, right? She's, she's pregnant with Jesus. All of these things of his life have not come to pass yet. And yet the Holy Spirit had come over her in a way where what she's experiencing in the present moment was still years, decades away in the future. She knew and trusted in God's love. She knew and trusted in God's promise that she was able to see in that moment and to thank God for what was yet to unfold. But she also was relishing and glorying in the present moment that she was experiencing with this baby in her womb. And I love... The, the subversive way that God works. And we see Mary's words prophetically calling out realities that would one day come to be as Jesus grew up. Things like he is going to exalt the humble. Things that like he would scatter the proud. That he would bring down princes from their thrones, right? The way of God and the love of God goes so against the ways of the world. I didn't... She was living in this reality, and she could experience that with each kick of the Savior in her womb, this subversive reality shows us something really, really uh, profound, that the invisible work of a mother 
can actually yield the most powerful impact. Isn't that just like God? To take the ways that kingdoms would be toppled and to do it through the sleepless nights of a mother nursing her babe. That through long days of teaching him to read, uh, for long days as these parents teaching him the family trade, uh, that that would actually pave the way to eventually kingdoms being toppled by the king of kings himself. That the humbled would indeed be exalted. And the thing about Mary is that she was willing to submit, to get low, so that this mighty work of God could unfold in its proper time. Right? Here's what's true of Mary's life that's also true of us. Right, here's a takeaway. It's like you could get one thing uh, from this message. This is what I want us to walk away with, is that the posture of love is low. We see this in the life of Mary. We see this in the life of Jesus, who left all of heaven to come as a baby in a feeding trough. So, so what might this look like for us to posture ourselves low, to posture ourselves to live a life of love. I mean, for those of us who have kids, uh, maybe you can relate to those times where why does it always seem like you come home from work, we're tired, right? It's been a long day. Maybe you've been putting out fires in your office or in your classroom or wherever, and all they want to do is just be on the ground and draw one more Spider-Man. I mean, this is an example from like my life this week, right? In all of our exhaustion, those times where we can get low, get on the ground, play with our kids, drive one more round of carpool pickup from all the sports and all the things, right? Those are the moments as parents where we posture ourselves low, where we posture ourselves in the love that Jesus invites us into, right? Or maybe... For you, one of the ways we can posture ourselves low to live this life of love is filling out that form, putting one of those gold boxes under the Christmas tree, signing up to serve this Christmas. Maybe it's finding ways to serve ongoing in a more regular basis, being a part of what God is doing through this incredible community here at Restoration Church. For those of you servant leaders, you've probably experienced the way God meets you in the moments when you're serving when we're saying, I'm going to set the table, I'm going to actually prepare for someone else to experience the love of God. Right? Maybe it's like Jeff and Lisa living into this calling to be foster parents, to open our homes, whether in an official way through the foster care system or maybe just through kids in the neighborhood who might need a safe place to come in for a meal or to play or have an open heart to listen to what's going on in their day. Maybe one of the ways that we can posture ourselves to live this life of love and to embrace the loneliness is maybe for some of you who are, who are dating or are single or trusting God um, in the way that you live your life, maybe saying, God, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to choose to leverage this amazing season of my life to serve you, to put your needs above my needs, to honor you, God, in my relationships. That is a way that we can say, God, what you value weighs more to me than what I value. Maybe for those of you who are married, embracing this posture of love, and this posture of lowliness, maybe it's valuing time with your spouse, maybe it's asking them what they need or they want, asking them, hey, what do you want to do for date night? Prioritizing our relationship, finally saying yes to go to therapy, whatever it is in our relationships, in our marriages, what if we embrace this posture of low? Those of you who might be in seasoned marriages, you know <laughs> that it's the times where we're able to put the needs of the other person. That's, that's how it works. That's how it stays healthy. That's how it stays vibrant beyond those early years. Maybe it's inviting a neighbor to church or funding the party. We say that around here a lot. The way that we invest and give of our hard-earned money to say, God, actually the things that you're doing in and around me matter more than that new iPad. So God, I'm going to choose to give. I'm going to choose to give to the things that your heart cares about, God. There's so many ways that as we 
look at love as not this beautiful thing that is kind of this like lofty butterfly feeling, but love as this active doing, as this posturing ourselves low. I wonder if that might shift or change something in us this week in the way that we live, in the way that we serve, in the way that we show up in our most important relationships. And uh, as we close, I, I wanted to share something with you that I read this week, and it's the words of Diedrich Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a world-renowned Christian theologian um, and thought leader during World War II. And he was actually a political prisoner in Germany who was locked up for the ways that he spoke out against Hitler and the Nazi regime. And there was a vast number of his writings. I'm actually reading one of his books right now. It's like an Advent reflection um, because there's tons of his writing, his letters, things that he had written from prison um, to his family, to his friend, uh, to his fiance, Maria. And uh, as he's writing out these letters, pouring out his heart, pouring out his devotion from a prison cell, uh, I wanted to read uh, some of his words that truly um, inspired me because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. It says this, he says, who among us will celebrate Christmas correctly. Whoever finally lays down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism, hello. Imagine the context from which he's writing this. It still rings so true for us. He says, beside the manger, whoever remains lowly and lets God alone be high, Whoever looks at the child in the manger and sees the glory of God precisely in his lowliness, right? That question, who among us will celebrate Christmas correctly? It's those of us who are willing to lay down ourselves in order to see God in all of his glory. My John uh, 5.13 a different John, not John the Baptist, but, but John actually was recorded as saying that there is no greater that love than he who lays down his life for his friends. It's talking about Jesus, talking about this ultimate lowly posture that Jesus embodied where he said, I'm literally willing to give all that I have, pour out all of my love in the form of my life, in the coming to earth and in the crucifixion and ongoing today. Jesus desires to do this incredible work of glorious love in our lives. And so my hope and prayer is that this Advent, as we are posturing ourselves, as we are preparing our hearts for Jesus, in the midst of all the shopping and all the planning and all the communication with family and all the Christmas cards, that we would pause, that we would find a way to remember the love of God. We started a new uh, tradition in our family this year as, you know, our life group, our mom's group that met uh, this Thursday, we were actually sharing, you know, I love Christmas cards. Um, I know they're a lot of stress and kind of like gives me the hot sweats every Christmas thinking about finally getting them out. Um, but I love them because as other people's cards come in the mail, um, it reminds, I, I can't throw them away for whatever reason. Um, I keep every year, I keep them, even as Kurt, he's like rolling his eyes over here. Um, I keep them, I like tie a ribbon, a hole punch or tie a ribbon around it because I love going back each year and seeing how people grow up and how families and friends like change over the years. And so this new tradition that we started this year is that um, every day when we're doing our little Advent reading with our kids, we pause and whatever Christmas cards we got that day, um, we pray for those families. We pray for those friends. We pray for those people who scattered all around the country and all the world. Many of you, we prayed for you this week if you sent us a card. Um, feel free to text us prayer requests, even if you don't send the cards. Cool, we'll still pray for you. Um, but it was this incredible reminder that this time of year is, is such an invitation to stop and to find ways to pour out love that we may lose sight of otherwise. As our to-do lists can get higher, God says, actually, no. Being present with me is what matters most. Noticing the needs of people around you is what actually draws you closer, is what actually fulfills you in the deepest space of your heart. And so we're going to do something here that we do every first Sunday of the month. 
Um, it's a simple reminder. It's a simple invitation that God knew that uh, even though we as followers of Jesus desire to be faithful, desire to follow him with all that we are and all that we have, as much as we want to be faithful, God in his loving kindness knew that we can tend to be forgetful. And so one of the things that Jesus did um, on the night he was betrayed, uh, he gathered his friends in an upper room. They shared a meal together with common elements like bread and wine, things that they had eaten together countless days before. Um, but Jesus gives us this reminder. He gives us this picture. He gives us this practice that now, thousands of years later, as Christians, we can come to the table to remember the sacrifice, to remember the love that Jesus poured out for us. And so communion is simply that. It's simply uh, a reminder that as Jesus you know, was up with his friends around the table, he took bread, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup, he said, this is my blood poured out in love for you. So that as we come forward to the table, as we come forward to the table, there's no need to have our lives perfect and put together. Jesus said, anyone who wants to is invited to come. No proving, no achieving necessary. Simply come and receive the love of Jesus. And so in just a minute, I'm going to pray. Um, and that will be your cue to come up whenever you feel ready. Um, there's bread and wine. Uh, there's prepackaged communion cups as well that are gluten-free because uh, we don't want anyone to feel like there's any kind of barrier. Um, if you feel safer with prepackaged, that's great. But let this be an invitation to come forward to remember the love and sacrifice of Jesus. The love that he has for you is so powerful. And so profound that he was willing to get low, to posture himself the lowest he possibly could, to leave the highest heavens to the lowest place on earth because of his love for you. So let's pray and then we'll continue our worship together. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for just a moment to take a deep breath to allow some of the anxiety that we maybe feel in our body to subside, to allow our hearts to be focused and centered on you and your love. And God, I thank you that you sent us this incredible gift of Jesus, that even though it was free, it wasn't cheap. It cost you everything. And God, you did it because you loved us. You did it because deep in your heart, you envisioned a world where we would be together, where we would be one, where we would be connected with you in a close, intimate relationship, that we wouldn't feel far away, distant, separated from you, that we would know your heart. So God, I thank you this time of year where we're reminded Maybe our hearts are a little bit more aware, a little bit more sensitive. Lord, our emotions might be a little bit more full. And that, God, you actually say that's good. That you invite us to come to bring all of who we are, emotions and all, and you say it's good. You say we belong. You say this table is a place where we can come and remember you. So, God, I pray as we eat and as we drink the cup, that you would just remind us, let your love flow over us from the inside out, Lord. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would transform our lives to be more and more like you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. <laughs>